when I got into my teens, I became a bit of a problem for a lot of the teachers because I'd get all my work done as quickly as possible and then it became a game to distract everybody else and stop them from doing theirs. The typical trait I see with children who have disruptive behavior, it's, it's actually a sign in a lot of ways of, of intelligence. University education is the pinnacle of achievement. And of course the reality nowadays is very different. You know, the reality is a lot of people are getting degrees and then they're getting jobs which anyone could pretty much get. It's actually quite difficult to separate yourselves because everyone's got degrees these days, right? That was why I dropped out of college. I used to come in the office half hour before anybody else. I used to stay in the office half hour later than everybody else. I used to take 15 minutes for my lunch instead of an hour. For your five days that you work, I'm actually getting six days for your five. Even if I'm no better than you, automatically I'm earning 20% more. Welcome back to the Warwick Academy podcast. I am here today with Joe Woodhouse. Joe, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, mate. How are you today? Yeah, really good, mate. Yourself? I am doing well. Yeah, another hot day here in Dubai. You know, the rainy day here in the UK. <laughs> there we go. So if you, you, you might want what I've got and I want what you've got. So the grass is always greener. Never happy, are we? Never happy. Well, maybe that's a British thing. I don't know. We're, we're, we're certainly never happy about the weather. <laughs> Well, I think the British thing is talking about the weather, to be fair. Well, and we haven't disappointed. Have we? Yeah. we kicked off this episode talking about the weather. So, um... <laughs> so um, for anyone who's uh, watching, anyone who lives in the UAE will probably know exactly who you are. They may have seen your video content. They may have um, you know, seen your socials, maybe even know you in person. And for anyone who, who isn't aware of who you are, could you just give a very brief kind of background uh, about what it is you do and, you know, your involvement with the UAE. Yes, yeah, so the tagline is basically I stop people effing up the finances. So I'm a financial advisor by trade, but when I tell that to people, a lot of people go, oh, like, the industry's got quite a bad name. And quite rightly so, to be fair, because there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of BS, there's a lot of noise within my industry. And in, in my opinion, it's built that way. It's a lot, the financial service industry is built a certain way to mystify and confuse people, to keep the consumer at arm's reach, to make people like me seem more important, more intelligent than we actually are. When in reality for a lot of people, if you follow a few simple steps, you can get where you need to be before you need to employ someone like myself. And I'd been in financial services for almost 20 years. And so one thing one of my old mentors taught me at a very young age and something that's always stuck with me is if you cannot explain something to an eight-year-old, you don't really understand it yourself. So I've made a career of trying to take this jargon-filled nonsense and just breaking it down into plain English, to, into a language that people like you and I understand. Mm. And then on the back of that, about six years ago now, I started creating content, talking about um, sort of these sort of topics. And so, yeah, so I'm a financial advisor by trade, um, I create a lot of content around financial services, around having a family, around running a business. So, and I try and inject humor into it as well. And I, I, I make quite a few skits and like funny videos. And I'm not frightened of laughing at myself, which I think is also quite rare in my industry because it's very egotistical driven. And yeah, it seems to resonate with a lot of people. And the, re the, the reason I do that, I'm a strong believer of if you're, if you're smiling, if you're laughing, if you're enjoying yourself, you retain more information. Mm. So what I do is I, I share information with people so they can get from A to B with their own finances. Cool, brilliant! What a what a, what a great intro. And um, a lot of um, a lot of people listening to this will be expats, right? And I know that you you were and your family were expats for a long time. Yep. And um, to get to get some context in that, just tell me a little bit about growing up in your childhood and 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 where your life kind of began. Was it always in the north of England or? Yeah. So. I was born in Sheffield, a typical working class family. My dad was, so mum and dad and younger brother. My dad, um, or still is, my dad's a market trader. So my dad sells second-hand bric-a-brac on Sheffield, Chesterfield, Rotherham, Barnes and Markets. And very, very hardworking. Uh, my, dad, my dad came off the roughest council estate in Sheffield. And my dad's lifelong ambition was to get off of the council estate and buy his own home, which he did, which was the house that me and my brother grew up in. 
But I mean, my dad used to work from 4 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. He doesn't do quite as much now. He's in his early 60s, but he's still a, my dad's still a workhorse. And I think he was also very strict as well with me and my brother. Well, more so me because I was the oldest. I think I was the experiment and the guinea pig um, of, of how far he could push us. Um, so, yeah. yeah so that's, I, that's often the case with, with parents, right? They... Um... You know, it's the it's the first, the eldest child who kind of receives the brunt of the parents' learning of how to parent. Yeah, and look, we're the same. I mean, I've got five year old twin boys and a three year old daughter, and yeah. every day is a school day, isn't it? I'm learning yeah. every single day how to be a parent. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. So I was speaking to a martial artist the other day, and I was, we were talking about it, and he said, "What's it like to be a parent?" Because he was not a parent, and I said, "Well, it's a bit like being a martial artist. It's like a journey of self discovery. You learn you learn more about you know yourself." by parenting than anything else. And yeah. I kind of find martial arts is very similar to that, right? It's uh, it's easy to criticize by just watching YouTube videos from you know professional fighters or you know criticizing people, but until you're in the arena, uh, you, until you've got a screaming toddler in front of you and you know learning how to parent, you're kind of doing it a lot of the time on the job. We're not born with a manual. Yeah, yeah. So like well, I so back to sort of growing up, actually my dad was very straight, very hardworking, very driven. Mm. And it was a very traditional household. So my mum did work part time. My mum worked in school for the NHS for a bit. Secretary as assistant, um, executive assistant work. But my mum was looked after the house. So my mum managed the house. She cooked. She cleaned. She did everything for me and my brother. Um, and yeah, she's very loving, very motherly type. Um, so yeah, and that that, that was about it really. Um, went through school, did all right in school. Could have done better. I, 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 I was always very quick at picking things up. So I don't want to use the phrase I was very intelligent because I wasn't. I just retained information quite well. But I also had a very short attention span. So when I got into my teens, I became a bit of a problem for a lot of the teachers because I'd get all my work done as quickly as possible and then it became a game to distract everybody else and stop them from doing theirs. Just right. out of boredom. Not out of maliciousness, just out of boredom, really. Mm. Um yeah, do, then, you know, do you know what? This that's a really typical um, trait I see with uh, children who have disruptive behaviour. It's it's actually a sign in a lot of ways of of intelligence. It can go it can go one or two ways. Either a they struggle a lot with what they're learning and they kind of give up because they're not getting the support they need, uh, and then they start having disruptive behaviour with other kids, or they've completed it. It's too easy, and because they're not getting enough engagement, uh, you know, they they start disrupting around the right. Yeah, and I learned how to play my mum off as well with the teachers. Right. So if I went, when bad reports were coming in from school that he's being disruptive, he's doing this, he's doing that. If I went home and told my mum that it's because the work's not challenging me, my mum used to, my mum used to, really bad, but my mum used to argue back order with the teachers. I was just really? pushing him enough, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So but if there are any work Academy students listening to this, uh, you, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Right? <laughs> so if, you, if you're a teacher, I'm a couple of <laughs> behaviour. Just being to mum or dad and say, "That's not you know, <laughs> um, So yes, yeah, so I left. I left school at sixteen, and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But like I said, my dad was from like a very rough area, rough council estate, and nobody, no Woodhouse had ever gone to university. So my dad's ambition for me was, I was good because I was. I'm the eldest out of all the grandkids. Yeah, I was going to be the first Woodhouse to go to university, and same with the school teachers. Like, look, you're a bright lad, and I had it drilled into me that without A levels and a degree, you either work on the markets with your dad, which I really didn't want to do, yeah, or you become a bin man, which I didn't want to do. Mm. So I sort of got pushed down the further education route to go to college. Just again because I didn't know, I didn't want to go to college. I just knew I didn't want to be a bin man or a market trader. Yeah, right. I, and, do you know what? I, I hear this. I hear the same kind of story from so many, so many people, especially in the US and the UK, right, where um, there's almost like this um, college, A-level, uni treadmill, right, where parents kind of stick their kids on. A lot of it comes goes back to the parents necessarily didn't have that opportunity or it's, you know, it's, it's really ingrained in the parents to see university education as the pinnacle of achievement. And of course, the reality nowadays is very different. You know, the reality is a lot of people are getting degrees and then they're getting jobs which anyone could pretty much get. It's actually quite difficult to separate yourselves because everyone's got degrees these days, right? Yeah, and that was why I dropped out of college. 
Yeah. Because I I left school at 50, 15, 16, started working part time. Um because my mum and dad made me get a part-time job there and I started working part-time while I got pushed into it as a cashier at Lloyd's Bank. Right. And the cashiering side, I was horrendous at. Like, my till was never balanced at the end of the day. It was always wrong. I must have got every record for every cash error going. But I fell in love with the relationship building, with the sales side of it. So it's a little bit different now because there's no real targets and sales targets in banks. But back then, when I was 16... Every it was when you used to go into a bank and you'd speak to the cashier and be like, right, do you want to speak to us about grading your account? We can get you better rate on your savings. We can we can reduce the interest you're paying on your credit card by turning it into a loan and all these different products that we used to sell and we used to be targeted on. As a cashier, and I've always been a numbers man, mm. and as a cashier, I used to get paid three pound on top of my salary for every referral I made that the, the sales advisors then sold the product to. And it just became an obsession. Mm. I, I was like a bone with a dog. And like people used to, I worked in the the busiest, the high street branch in Sheffield town, the city centre. And it was the biggest branch in, in Yorkshire, one of the biggest branches in the country. So we'd always got people queuing out the doors. And I used to pitch every single person to the point where people would wait in the queue and let other people go in front of them to avoid me because they'd heard me pitch the five people before them. Um, but honestly, like a game, like, you would not leave my till until you either sat down with a manager or stormed out of the banking hall in disgust. Oh, wow. Um, I, I was was you, you were pretty intense going to your bank then. Oh, yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it was like a battlefield. Um, but I, I just became obsessed with it, and I became obsessed with learning about relationships, about negotiation, about sales, about... And I just, I just fell in this rabbit hole with it. Yeah. I remember, I bought, I bought this book called um, "Kiss Guide to Selling," the Keep It Simple series, mm. um, and it was like this thick book, like, like Bible-sized book, and it went everywhere with me. Like I went to bed with it, I went to work with it, I went everywhere with this book, and I just I memorized it front to back, and it was dog-eared, it was notes and scribbles everywhere, and often pages were missing by the end of it. Um, and that taught me so much. And then also I, I used to latch on to a lot of the top sales guys within the bank, a lot of the managers. And again, look, I, I pretty much worked out that if I do X amount of sales per day, which is X amount per week, which is X amount per month, I double my salary for what I'm earning right. as a cashier. So the cashier inside of things, I just didn't care about. Didn't care if my tour were wrong at the end of the day. And I used to get a lot of leeway because I brought in that much revenue for the bank. It was like, yeah, but it's fine. Joe still don't need the balance. Uh, <laughs> so I got away with a lot. And I remember the Ian Swarick is called one of my first mentors. He was the top sales guy in the UK for Lloyd's Bank at the time, uh, top financial advisor. And it was, I, I were at college five days a week, working a couple of days a week in Lloyd's Bank. And I'm sat on this row of cashiers and there's me, there's like all the like five or six middle-aged female cashiers who were all amazing. They mothered me. Like, you'll never know. And I still speak to a lot of them today. Well, one had got a degree, one had got A-levels, one had got a master's. And they're all sat on this row of tills with me. I'm actually earning twice as much as they are because of all these sales I'm bringing into the bank. Mm. And I was just like, and that was a bit of a, like a, a switch in my head. And I'm like, what? like you said earlier, I'm like, why are you sat here? And you've been through all that. You've spent all that money in university. Yeah. And I went to go and speak to Ian. And I'll never forget it like it was yesterday. Walked in his office, I went, what qualifications have you got? And he leant back in his chair, and he used to have this toothpick in his mouth, and he took this toothpick out of his mouth. He went, son, when I was your age, I couldn't spell my effing name. Then he got this. Then he opened his drawer, got his piece of paper out, and threw it out there. And I opened this piece of paper, and it had got more zeros on it than I'd ever seen in my entire life. And it was his pay slip with his bonus on it. And he went, what? And he went, what are you doing? I went, I'm going to college. He said, what do you want to do? And I just instantly went, I want to do this. And he went, why are you going to college then? I, went, I don't know. It's just what they, they told, they've told told me I need to do. Mm. And he went, I'll give you some advice. Go in tomorrow. You were from Barnbleth, like rough as the day is long, uh, but was very, very charismatic. And he said, mm. go in tomorrow, shove them two fingers up and tell them to shove it. I didn't do his direct as that, but that's what I did. I went into college the day after, packed in, and then started working full-time at the bank, and that's oh. how I got into financial services. Wow. 
That is so interesting, isn't it? So, yeah. Starting point for you, right? You kind of yeah. looked at the future and um, you know, the, the future route that you were going down that was kind of predetermined for you. Yeah. Early on enough, you realized wasn't the right route, which I think yeah. is... Uh, uh, how old are you then? You were, what, 18? Uh, I'm I, 18 now. I'll take that as a compliment. No, no. Well, you're 18 now. You're, you're, you're no, I was, college, right? or... I was 16. I was 16. I'd been in college five weeks. <laughs> uh, I know you're not 18 now. Yeah, 36 now. Do I You've done a lot. You've done a lot for an 18 year old. <laughs> Rough paper round. He's grim in the north. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, wow. Okay. So, uh, you you're then you then started this career in financial services. At what point did you? I know we're probably skipping forward quite a few years, but at what yeah. point did you then decide to move to Dubai? When I was 22. So, I like so at 16, I decided there and then I want to be go down the sales route within mm. the bank. I want to be an account manager. And it actually makes sense when you say it out loud, but like, you can't do it until you're 18. I'm like, why? I said, I'm better than anybody else. I'm more, I've, I took all my qualifications, took my exams. I was more qualified than most of the advisors in the bank, in the country, um, because I was very yeah. aware of my age. So I'm like, right, I need to beat him in everything else. And mm. like I said, I was just like a dog with a bone. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You're not old enough to take out a loan. Therefore, you cannot sell a loan. <laughs> I'm like, actually, yeah, that does make sense. Um, so on my 18th birthday, I got promoted to account manager and then worked my way through the bank. Um, but when, I remember when I packed in college, I told my dad, I didn't tell him until after I'd done it because I knew he'd go mental. And yeah, he didn't speak to me for three months, like nothing. Like oh. li we lived in the same house. He did not utter a word to me for three months. Yeah. So I'd throw, I'd throw my life away. Um, and his, you know, his, a lot of, a lot of kind of expectation and pride for him was the fact that he was probably telling telling his mates and the family that you were going to be the first one to go to uni and all this sort of stuff, right? Yeah, and I, I, I do think a lot of it was ego-driven as well. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I know he wanted the best for me, and he did his best, and I know my father loves me dearly, but yeah, I think it is, he, he liked to brag to his mates. He wanted me to be, my dad wanted me to be a barrister. Right. Um, so that's what you should tell everybody, that I'm going to be a lawyer, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then, uh, yeah, five weeks later, I packed college in. Just to show you, uh, for you, yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever sounded yeah. best, I, I can understand. But my dad's very risk averse as well, right? And so I had the same thing when I was twenty-two. Mm. So then I remember being twenty-two, and I was one of the senior managers at Lloyd's. And I mean, for a twenty-two-year-old, I was earning insane money. I think on like sixty, seventy grand a year at twenty-two. Yes. Um, and one of my good friends and other mentors moved out to Abu Dhabi eighteen months before to become an independent financial advisor. And he then offered me a job. So I put all this work in, worked my way through the bank. And then I went home one day and I'm like, Dad, I'm quitting. He's like, he's only, he's only just got off the uni thing. Pretty much, yeah. He went, what? I went, I'm quitting. I'm like, why? So I'm moving to Abu Dhabi. He went, where's that? I went, Middle East. And he's like, to do what? I'm like, hold on to your hats. To not get paid a salary. <laughs> I'm like, it's a commission-only job. You, uh, how many siblings have you got? One. One, okay. But you, were you consider yourself like the black sheep of the family? Well, um, the risk, I, I, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. My younger yeah. brother actually works with my dad. So, I mean, oh, okay, he's yeah. a market trader as well. Uh, so, you kind of went against the grain there. And then, you know, they, at this stage, they're probably expecting this sort of stuff from you, right? I'm guessing. Well, I, I don't know. I think my dad does now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I think what, where he came from is my dad's never had a salary. So, my dad's always right. been a self employed market trader. So, my dad's had. The bad winters. My dad's had yeah. it years. My dad, like my dad's had it where the suppliers he buys the stuff from cut it out. So my, my dad's had that, and I think he wanted for me. My dad wanted a safe, stable, secure job. Like yeah. you get a job, you work up the corporate ladder, you buy a house, you get a wife, you have children, life complete. That, that's my dad. Um, as yeah, it's, so it's really interesting because actually a lot of um, a lot of entrepreneurs who build successful businesses and. Um, and they've done it, you know, without necessarily going to uni or having a degree or whatever. They they then want their kids to have a degree, and they actually put a lot of pressure on their kids to have a degree, even though it's a completely different route that's brought them the success that they've got. And I think that's often the case of because you know you want security for your kids, and it kind of feels like if you, if they do go down that you know, that, that route, they are going to get more security, right? And so you kind of want for your kids what you didn't have in a lot of ways. But again, that comes at cost. And I worked this out. I didn't actually realize this until I moved to Abu Dhabi when I was 22. 
and overnight started earning more money than I could ever imagine. Mm. Because I went from getting paid an hourly rate and a bit of bonus commission, whatever you want to call it, for a product being sold. There was always a cap on what I could earn. Right. And then I moved to Abu Dhabi and I was sat and I remember sat in the office and I remember saying, so let me get this right. If I work twice as hard as him, I earn twice as much as him. Yeah. And if I work twice as hard as her, I earn twice as much as her. And it was like the penny just dropped. And like it, again, like I said, I've always been into numbers. So again, it became you're, a game. You're getting paid directly for your output. Exactly. About exactly, you, yeah. Rather than, yeah. 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 So, and and again, that was the so same. So, I draw a kind of high performance individual and you, you know, you enjoy that aspect and you're happy to take the risk on that. Then it's the kind of perfect role for you, right? Because yeah. high risk, high reward. Yeah. So, as well as bettering, my, bettering myself at my craft, I was also like, I used to come in the office half hour before anybody else. I used to stay in the office half hour later than everybody else. I used to take 15 minutes for my lunch instead of an hour. And I worked out simple maths in my simple brain that for your five days that you work, I'm actually getting six days for your five. Yeah. So even if I don't get any, even if I'm no better than you, automatically I'm earning 20% more. Yeah. Just by coming in a little bit early and staying a little bit later. So for me, we just like, that was common sense. It just made perfect sense to me. Uh, it sounds like you're analyzing things quite a lot for a young age, then, right? Yeah. I probably over, I probably overanalyze things sometimes, but yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's no doubt that served you a lot with you know with your career and your and your business. Yeah, um, yeah. So Abu Dhabi for a long time, and then Dubai, and then at what point did you decide to create your own business? So uh, I, I suppose I'm entrepreneur, if you like, a business within a business. Okay. Um, so again, I use a network which I put the business through. Um, but again, within my business, I've got my own staff, I've got my own employees, I've got my own sort of processes, systems in place. Um, so I suppose really since I was 22 and I had, right. and, and I fell into it. And if it hadn't been for John, um, who moved out there 18 months before that we were the best man at my wedding, our best man at his, like we've been thick as thieves for years. If it hadn't been for him, would I have done it? I always said I wanted to move abroad, but I don't know because yeah. it was very comfortable at Lloyd's. I was 22. Yeah. I got a nice car. I were earning more money than any of my mates. Um, we just we actually just bought our first house. My now wife, she was girlfriend at the time, but we just bought our first house together as well. So, in my head, the the ceiling limit I put on it, things were going really well. Um, and it really went. I find it a bit comfortable in getting uncomfortable as well. I've always been the same, um, and I get bored quite easy. Uh, so I enjoy the challenge. You know, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily just about trying to further your career and earning more and that sort of stuff. There was a sense of adventure you were trying yeah. to build. Yeah, definitely. I remember telling people, like to bear in mind I'm from Sheffield, very small minded place for most yeah. of it. I remember saying to people, oh, I'm moving to Abu Dhabi. And the amount of people that went and this was in twenty ten, before beginning of twenty ten, before the F one, before anyone people knew where Dubai was because it had been on all the documentaries the year before, but no one had heard of Abu Dhabi. Right. I'm saying, oh, I'm moving to Abu Dhabi. They're like, oh, is that in Wales? I'm like, no, no, that's Aberystwyth. <laughs> Does sound a bit similar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, do you know what? I, I find that a lot of expats, you know, when I when I look at the sort of people who choose to leave what is quite a comfortable life back home, right, and the security you've got, the welfare you can have, um, you know, the educate your kids are looked after, you got you got you know, education for your kids, you've got, you know, NHS and so on and so on, right? They leave all of that to go to the UAE in the pursuit of trying to improve their lives or the fact or providing more for their family or whatever it is. And it's like, what what is it that, you know, what, what are the traits that people need in order to take that jump? And so I, I find that people in who, who I've met in Dubai tend to be a bit more adventurous than, than a lot of the people I've met in the UK because they are the ones who have decided to kind of to take the leap, right, and to move abroad. And ex expat life is funny, I think, because once you do it once, once you move once, you realize the world is a small place. And really, you don't need to live in the place that you've always been living in. You know, there are so many opportunities out there in the world that you could just take. And, you know, if you've got a bit of, bit of courage about you, you could explore these opportunities. Yeah, hundred percent. I think a lot of expats are very resilient, and they're also very open as well mm. as meeting people. I mean, you've got to be because you move to. I mean, I was lucky. I got John. Other than John, I knew nobody in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So, 
someone once explained described it to me that because you leave your family at home, you make your own family as right, an expat, yeah. which I think is true because I'm probably closer with a lot of the people that I was very good, still I'm very good friends with that I met in Abu Dhabi and Dubai yeah. than I am most people back here in the UK because yeah. you, you, you sort, you're thrust on each other, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think when you're in the UK, if you grew up in the UK and you stay in the UK, you've got that kind of feeling of familiarity at all times, right? You you know, you've got old friends from school who have always been around you. You've got family who have always been around you. You've got friends of the family as well. You've got, you know, whatever you've been a part of, they've always been around you. So when you do go to a completely new environment, it's like a complete reset. Yeah, and I found as well, I, I, I growing up, I was always a little bit of an outsider. Yeah. Actually, the area I grew up in, people aspired, to, and there's nothing wrong with this, by the way, but people aspired to be a joiner, a plumber, an electrician, yeah. uh, a builder, a, a roofer. And I personally couldn't think of anything worse. Right. Like, all I knew was that I didn't want to work outside because I'd been through the school holidays where my dad dragged me to the market with him, and it weren't fun. When the weather's crap, working outside's not good. Mm. And so I just knew I didn't want to do that. And so I was always... I didn't, I suppose I didn't know back then, but I was always looking for something. And I always said from a young age, I want to get out of Sheffield. I don't want to stay in Sheffield. I want to move. I want to be out there somewhere. Don't know where, but I want to leave as yeah. quick as I can. Yeah. And um, so, so yeah. But I, I mean, I mean, education wise, I actually, I, I boxed as a kid growing up. Okay. Um, 10 to 21. I had 43, I think, amateur fights. Oh, brilliant. I, and I probably learned more on life and sort of what you need outside of school from that boxing gym on yeah. a stinky, smelly, sweaty boxing gym on a council estate in Sheffield than I did from school all the way through. You'd be, I, hear, I hear that so often, you know, that martial artists have the kind of similar story. You know, it's it's like I said at the beginning of this, right? Parenting as well as martial arts, like a, like a journey of self-discovery. And I think you... You put yourself through something so challenging like that, you know, and I can imagine in that environment, there are all sorts of threats and challenges around you all the time that yeah, basically push you as a human being to, to better yourself. And a sense of urgency to that as well, right? Like you've, yeah. got, to get, you've got to get good at this quickly or, you, or that pain is going to get worse. Yeah, just exactly. something you feel is going to get worse so that yeah. you're suddenly motivated when you go through that. And, and my, my coach used to, again, one, again, another mentor of mine, uh, Glyn Rhodes, who yeah. he was like a second dad to me growing up. Um, he always used to say, train hard, fight easy. Yep. He's like, oh, you either get uncomfortable now or you get uncomfortable when you're under those spotlights. In a, back then, we were in a smoky working men's club when I was 13 year old, getting my face punched in by a, a kid that I didn't know. So so the harder we trained, the easier the fights were and the more prepared you were. But it all contributed that kind of time and then, you know, learning a box in that environment as a young person really contributed to your work ethic as an adult. Thousand percent. Like most of my education, again, if I look at the people that actually taught me anything growing up, I would say my dad taught me my, my, his work ethic. Because look, kids copy what you do. Co kids copy what they see, not what you say. Yeah. So you can sit here all day and tell tell your kids how hard working they should be, how they should eat healthy, how they should do this, how they should do that. If you're sat with your string vest and on the sofa, with your face glued to your phone all day, eating Snickers bars. Like, yeah. they see that they don't hear what you're saying to them but they see how you're living and they see that as being normal as what I saw as being normal was not seeing my dad like, I saw as being normal my dad leaving before I'm up to go to work good to go to school my dad getting in after I went to bed at night once I'm bathed and ready for bed like that was why I saw my dad at weekends yeah. uh, that was completely normal for me just a quick shout out to the guys at Shield who manage this podcast come up with the strategy behind the podcast help me schedule interviews as well as do all of the editing and the producing of the podcast. Without them, we wouldn't be able to produce this podcast. If you would like to create your own podcast, I can't recommend the Shield team enough. They have done well over 100 episodes for me over the last few years, and I've been so pleased with the results. So have a look in the description of this video or the podcast episode, and you'll see how to get in touch with them yourself. It's a really interesting conversation around that with, first of all, um, you know, kids, kids model behavior, right? So they, they literally copy what they see. The way in which you speak to the waiter or the, you know, the person around you who's looking after you or 
you know, the way in which that you form relationships or you have conversations, the way in which you, even the way in which you argue with your partner, if you argue and how quickly you make up and what that looks like in conflict resolution or how you, how you kind of, um, navigate your own emotions, right. Or, or if you don't show any emotions, that has a negative impact as well. Like kids just copy everything. Yeah. And, and the, it's actually quite relieving, I think, as a parent to know that we're not born with a guidebook, right? But if you want to be a good parent, all you really need to focus on is being a good person. Yeah. If you focus on being a good person, which means not just talking about being a good person, but acting like a good person, you provide the framework and the kind of real time how to for your children as they grow up. So I think, I think there's something really relieving about that as well. But then what you said about um, your dad not being around, I totally relate with that. You know, my dad was in the army, so he would go away six months at a time. And um, a, a lot of pressure nowadays is placed on. Um, whoever is the breadwinner in the house, whether it's the mum or the dad, whatever, right? It's the pressure is placed on that individual to spend more time at home. And one of these I always say is, is it's your kids don't want your time. They want your presence. And, you know, my dad would go away for six months to war or on tour, whatever it was, in the jungle, whatever it was, right? He'd come home. And the time I had then had with him was really quality time. And, um, we always remember him as a great dad because of that, right? It wasn't, it was never a case of, you know, he was never around. It was, you know, how, what, what amazing adventures we had, he was around and what we got up to, the things we learned. And it sounds like that was a, this kind of similar sort of situation for you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and like I said, same with the boxing gym, like Glen Rhodes was MBE now, Glen Rhodes MBE. He'll kill me, he'll kill me if I don't add that on. But um, he, like I said, the things he taught me, not just, how to put my push my body to the limit it's not just i mean we used to train some days till we were sick like it was intense training which when i said to most people they look at me like i'm mad but that taught me more about myself than anything and he taught like it was big on looking people in the eye on speaking to people on and i think a lot of what i learned in that gym transferred over to my career within the bank because at 16 i wasn't frightened about speaking to anybody like yeah. I didn't care if you were a cleaner on the street or whether you're a multimillionaire business owner. Like, you've got the same two eyes, the same two arms, the same two legs. I'll speak to you exactly the same way and I'm not frightened of you. So, and, so Glenn, was, Glenn was your one of your key male role models growing up from the age of 13 to 20. Yeah, big time. Well, not, no, like 10, 11 to 21. Um, okay, so, so now, good, yeah. Like 12 years then, really. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, things like we used to be in the gym and he used to make us stand in the middle of the ring in front of the packed gym and sing a nursery rhyme. Or like he used to, he used to have me shadow boxing in slow motion to I can see the colours of the rainbow, which at the time I thought he was bonkers. <laughs> and what that taught me is to basically not give a shit what people think. Like not give into peer pressure, don't feel uncomfortable. Um, and I remember once he took us to a, a young offenders home at Borstal. Um, where we were going to do like a bit of a boxing exhibition. So like a few of the boxers, we'd, we'd have a bit of a spa and then they'd let the lads get up from from the, this ball store and let them try and hit us and we couldn't hit them back. So we'd have his hands behind his back, we'd be dancing around, like making a show of them, just a bit of fun for them. Yeah. And then Glyn also did a talk on resilience and had not give in to peer pressure on the reason you're all in here is because you've given into some sort of peer pressure. So just do you sort of thing. And as he's doing this talk, bear in mind there's, um, I think it was Calendar News, ITV News at the time, recording it. He got halfway through and went, Joe, come here. So I went on and he said, I can see the colours. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Well, we've had, and he no, went, you just went. Not in, front, not in front of the lads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally in front, in front of like 100 of these kids. Like some real bad eggs as well, like 14, 15 year olds. Some are in there for some serious stuff. Um, and I was this skinny little 13 year old, shadow boxing in slow motion on live news singing I can see the colours of the rainbow yeah. um, but again things like that like yeah. taught me how to get out of my comfort zone how to get out of my own way and not care about others opinion and to yeah. completely, completely dilute peer pressure yeah. what a yeah. brilliant you know, like, you know concept and, and, and kind of an exercise there I think um, it, it sounds like he, he was a really positive male role model for you and in a lot of ways um, I, a lot of people think that their dad is the only male role model they have in their lives. And we've got, we teach a lot of single parents who, for a lot of them, especially young kids who go to a primary school, they're taught by the, uh, by a female teacher a lot of the time in the UK, especially. And, you know, they go, they go home, the babysitter might be female in a lot of cases, 
Uh, their mum then is, you know, if it's a single mum. So they often don't have a male role. And so a lot of the students who, who come from single family homes who come to us, the only male role model they have is their child's instructor. And I've been in a situation very many times where I've looked after, especially young boys, and kind of shown them when they're kind of preteen to teen, the right way to behave as a man, as a male. And it's like, it, you know, very, it kind of sounds a lot like he was working, maybe not uh, together, but they were for the same objective with your dad on this kind of mission of developing your masculinity and turning you into a man and showing you the right way to live. Right? Oh, no, big time. And like, if I played up at school, my dad would tell Glenn. Right. And Glenn. So they were working together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Working together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glenn had punished me, Jim. Sometimes you listen to you to to another man in your life more than your dad as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. because because you try and get away with it when it's your dad, but when it's someone else, your martial arts instructor, let's say, you, you know, you, you don't see them as often, so you don't have that familiarity as much. Yeah. So you're I, kind of a bit more on the edge of your seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like I said, Glim weren't frightened of like punishing us and yeah. to the point where I mean, the, the worst thing they ever did was I really played up at school. Like I did something really bad at school as a kid. Yeah. Um, I basically I got well I wasn't stealing but I got accused of stealing uh, something from school and I were a kid I didn't think of it I got sent to go and pick something up from another classroom by a teacher brought this I can't remember what it was, I think key rings or something gave so many but put, shoved so many in my pocket because I'd worked out with an elastic band I could fire them around at other people mm. um, young boys uh, it made sense at the time but I got it, the teacher caught me with this bag of um, key rings in my pocket so I got put on report I got in all the serious trouble for stealing from the school mm. um, and my dad went ballistic and I weren't going to listen to my dad so yeah. he told Glenn and I got a fight coming up and the only reason I trained was to fight and they pulled me out of the fight and I remember and it was a trip to Devon as well so it was a weekend in Devon right so I'm going to have a weekend away from my parents with all the lads from the gym, we're gonna have all this fun. We, there were a, a boxing fight, the boxing um, tournament on the Saturday evening. Could be an amazing weekend, and they won't let me go, and they stopped oh, me going. Yeah, um, and that was probably the, that was the worst punishment they could have given. Me. Yeah. Um, God, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of those things, right? If you're if you're, if you're really punishing, it's, it's taking away the thing they want the most, and, and that, yeah, that's that's a good. Yeah. Example. I didn't do it again. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we we look at um, behavior of young people and we label it disruptive, and as they get older, we encourage them to be disruptive and challenge the status quo. And, and do you know what? This is something what I've always questioned everything. Like if you told me to do something and explain to me why it's a benefit, I'd, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. But if you tell me to do something but can't explain to me why, I would challenge that. And I and I I, I, I would t- hormone driven teenager, I'm very aggressive as well, so I was very cocky as a teenager. Mm. And I used to question everything. And I used to get so much bother for it. And my one of my twin boys, Henry, he's exact he's, he's me. He's a carbon copy of me. He's five. And he will not do anything unless you explain to him why yeah, to do it. Very strong will. Yeah, oh by insane. Yeah. But, but, but do you know what thing you want there? When when you've when you've got a team, if you're managing a team, the best way to get the team to lean in and to get kind of buy into a new set of rules or whatever it is, is to encourage them in actually creating the rules. Yeah, you know. So if you've got um, if you've got a, a really strong-willed child, rather than just saying these are the rules, that's it, say to them, you know, this is this is the challenge we've got. If you do this, it's not safe. So we need some rules in place. Can you help me make the rules? Right. We need you to pass your exams at school. So here's some problems. You know, you're on your computer too much. You're on your your phone too much. What what can we put in place to try and get you to a point where you can do that without me having to punish you or whatever? Or, you know, have these have all this discipline in place. So yeah, get more buy-in. But yeah, with, a, with a with a child who's strong willed, if you get them to make the rules with you, because then you can refer back and say, "Remember the rules we made? You know, these are the rules you came up with." Yeah, you know, believe that. Yeah, I'll try that with him. I mean, yeah, uh, your, your kids are quite young right now. They they are. Yeah, so, yeah. So, tw- so Henry and Jasper, my twin boys, they're five, and Aubrey, yeah. my daughter, she's three. Okay, cool. Just so, what's it like having twins? I wouldn't know any of the different. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> first. Yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a whirlwind because we yeah. we we struggled to have children naturally, which was a very difficult thing to go through. Mm. Um, so we had IVF living in the Middle East. So the boys were actually the fit. We had four failed attempts at IVF before we had the boys, which was the worst experience of my life. Um, but so when we had, we found out we were pregnant. We not much we involved when we found out Laura was pregnant. My wife, 
Um, you know, it was amazing, like the best moment ever. And I found out, I actually found out we were having twins by a text message. Right. Um, because I was, at the time I was flying around the region quite a bit. I was boarding a flight in Saudi Arabia to come back to Abu Dhabi. Laura phoned me hysterical. She was about, only about five or six weeks pregnant. But obviously with IVF, you know, from day one, whether it's took or whether it's not. Um, so you are actually aware you are pregnant for the full duration. Um, and obviously after all these failed attempts, it was like walking on eggshells everywhere we went because petrified that something could go wrong. Um, and I'm boarding a flight. Laura phoned me hysterical saying, oh, I'm, I'm bleeding. Um, and Laura's best friend, Sarah, was his midwife in Abu Dhabi. So I said, right, ring Sarah, get her to go to the clinic with you and go and have a scan, whatever you need to do. So that was that. I said, right, keep me posted. I said, look, on the flight, they sometimes have Wi-Fi, they sometimes don't. So I will not be able to take a call, but text me and let me know what's, what's what. So that was that. So that was obviously the worst flight I was ever boarding. Getting on this flight, didn't know what was happening, th thinking that we'd lost this baby that we that yeah. we've been for four years been trying to, trying to achieve. Gets on the flight, gets in the air, gets the Wi-Fi on, and I got a text message from Laura saying um, something about um, scans. Every everything's fine. Both uh, uh, sacks are fine. Heartbeats are fine. And I'm like, oh, thank God. So send a message back saying, oh, thank God. That was that. And then five minutes later, I got a message, another message saying, did you read your message? I'm like, yeah, everything's good. She like, read it again. So I read it again. And I sent one back saying, two, question mark. And she put, yeah. Uh, wow. So yeah. And I remember bursting into tears on this flight. Yeah. And there were a woman in front. Well, I'm not thinking about it. There were a woman in front. And then, um, sorry. And she turned around. I'm sat there crying my eyes out. And she's like, are you all right? And I just went, I'm having twins. And then, <laughs> God, I feel so good doing this. She then burst into tears. And, wow. Um, yeah, they were amazing. Amazing. Just just an overwhelming, after four years of trying, right? So then suddenly be kind of blessed with two. Yeah, very. At once, just. Yeah, yeah. Riding out on the flight. Yeah, they're a whirlwind as well. Are they? <laughs> yeah. Are they, are, they, are they both very similar or are they quite different? Nah, chalk and cheese. Really? Uh, yeah, so when they were born, Henry, so Henry's got blue eyes, sorry, Henry's got brown eyes um, and darker hair. No. They're both, they're both run now, but um, Jasper got the bright, brightest, bluest eyes like my wife um, wow. and, and light hair and the personalities are completely different. Wow. Is that amazing? Great fun. Wow. And what, a, what, a, what an amazing way to find out as well. Yeah. You, know, you can't go anywhere, so you just gotta celebrate the whole the whole <laughs> Yeah. On a drive celebrate flight from Saudi Yeah, on a drive flight from Saudi Arabia. Oh right, that's <laughs> not too much celebration. <laughs> Lots of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay, cool. So looking looking then at your life in you know, you, you had this incredible business, incredible career um in Dubai and you had you know, two two twins in Dubai. At what stage did you then decide to move back to the UK? Because I now, now you've been living in the UK for three years. So just got yep. me through that. What, what happened in your life? So flashback to summer 2019. Like I was flying around the region four days a week. Um, and my wife was like, look, we'd been in the Middle East for 10 years. And she was like, look, I'm a single parent half the week. She said, and a lot of our friends had left. A lot of the network we had in the UAE, you know, it's quite a transient place. People come, people go. So she said, look, could you do this flying back and forth from the UK. And I like, we can give it a go. But I said, look, we'll try it for three months, but I need you to promise me if this doesn't work, if we hate it, that we come back. And she was like, yeah, yeah, of course. Knowing what I know now, I think full well, she had no intention of ever coming back. Um, but she just pacified me. Yeah. And then the day before we flew back for the summer of 2019 to trial this three months back and forth, um, I got, a phone call from my mum saying she'd been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So at the time, me and Laura said, look, we're going back now. We're going to spend as much time as possible with my mum. And as grim as this sounds, the inevitable is my mum will pass away soon. When my mum dies, if we hate the UK, we can always then move back. So yeah, so that when we still came back for the three months Summer 2019, I've spent as much time with my mum as possible. We then mm. went back 
to the UAE to pack everything up. But by the time we officially left, it was more like January 2020. Because all of, all of this was going on at the same time as COVID, right? So that as soon as you move back to the UK, I mean, March, March 2020, it would have hit here. Yeah. And then April, May 2020 is when UK would have then been hit with lockdowns, right? Yeah, so that was tough because like I said, the main reason we were back is to see my mum and then yeah. we were told you can't see her. Um, and what was also tough as well with that is, and I get it, my mum had got the attitude of, I am going to die. I do not give a shit about the rules. I mm. want to see my kids. I want to see my grandkids. But me and Laura, and this was when all the hysteria was around it as well, but me and Laura were that petrified. I could never live with myself if I knew that my mum had caught something off of me and she died prematurely yeah. or prematurely because of me. So we used to have like these blazing rows with my mum as well because she was frustrated because she wanted to see us. Obviously, we were frustrated because we wanted to see her, but we also wanted to try and protect her at the time as well. So that was quite difficult. Um, and it was actually COVID that killed my mum in the end in March of 21 um, mm -hmm. she went in hospital to have this, this cancer was getting really bad and she went in the hospital to have um, they basically said no more chemo you, your body can't take it but she went in to have one of her organs removed because it's gone to one of the organs I can't remember which one it was um, and while she was in there conducted COVID and never came out wow um, but I mean one thing that and that I then went into a very dark place in summer of 21 Um where I couldn't control my emotions. I was just angry all the time. I was bitter. I was just, I, I was vile with Laura and the kids. Um, so I did a lot of soul searching. Then I actually spoke to a couple of therapists, which I, I speak quite openly about this. Um, and that for me didn't work because once, I know there's all this talk at the minute about mental health and how you need to open up and you need to talk about it. I don't think that's enough. Because yeah. what the what the therapy sessions actually did for me was made me question myself even more. And I'm very logical. Like for me, it A to B to C. It's a straight line. Like tell me and this is why I was going into these meetings saying, All right, tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm like, we well, don't work like that with mental health. We need to explore this, we need to do that. And I'm like, No, but I just want actionable things to do to stop me feeling this way. Mm. no one could give me this answer and all they all wanted to do were put on drugs and the first thing I said to I mean I spoke to two the first thing I said to both of them was do not prescribe me any drugs because I will not take them mm. rightly or wrongly I know antidepressants obviously work for some people but I'd seen what they'd done to my mum when my granddad died I'd seen what they did to my dad when my mum got diagnosed with cancer they just turned him into zombies mm. uh, and one thing I've always I always think I've had he's a very sharp mind very good at thinking outside the box and very quick at picking things up and I was petrified of losing that that edge that sharpness yeah. which was probably the reason why I was in that situation mentally anyway but I didn't want to lose that and all they kept trying going on is yeah but take these take these take these and I'm like no and the other thing I really struggle with as well is labeling myself so I'm not I'm not Gonna say I was depressed, but I was in a very bad way. Like, like this dark cloud was following me everywhere. I'd be walking the dogs in the field and just burst out crying. And it weren't as if I was particularly thinking about my mum or thinking about something sad. I'd just burst into tears. And I'm like, what? What's what's going wrong with me? What's happening? Um, I remember taking the kids to watch Paw Patrol, um, Paw Patrol movie, and chase one of the dogs. Couldn't get up a hill or something. I just burst into tears. And I had to go in the toilet. Luckily, my wife was with me. But I said to her, I, I just need to go. And I just had to leave the cinema theatre. Yeah. And I just couldn't, I couldn't hold myself together. Um, so I'm telling them this and like, and they're like, do you feel depressed? And I'm like, what's depression? And I'm like, well, it's different for everyone. I'm like, tell me what it is. Give me a tick list. Tell me what it is. And I'll tell you if I am or not. But they couldn't tell me why it was. But they right. had to try and label myself. They right? wanted to come out. Yeah. To come yeah. Out. And, and this was what I couldn't get my head around. I guess uh, in some ways, if they were, if they were to say this is what it, you know, here here is the criteria for depression, then that you know you could then become that, right? It would be like, you know, for a lot of people, if they were going to say that to them, they would grow into that role. A lot of the time, when we when we talk to people, they're going to grow into that, the role that we paint a picture of. So it could be that they were being careful of that. But it, but yeah. when, when you talk about um, being very careful to label yourself, I am this or I am that, 
that's it's so it's so important you know you're i think it takes your power away going through it you're going through exactly it. Exactly. Which got a very low yeah. mood, right? You're not, you know, you, it's the same way people label themselves unintelligent or overweight or whatever. It's like, you're not, you've just put on weight and now you could lose weight. You're not a fat person or an obese person or an unintelligent person or whatever, right? It's, yeah. As soon as you, as soon as you take ownership over that identity, it's very hard to break them all. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, I was going through this massive slump and that's when I got introduced to a guy called Paul Mort, who's a mentor and very close friend now. And, he ba- his tagline is he helps people get the shit together mm. um and he's, he's a sort of coach and i won't call him a life coach because he goes mad when people ex- describe him as that because he hates it but that's essentially what he does yeah and again what drew me to paul is he's from the north of england he's just a normal bloke but he'd gone through a lot more extreme what i'd gone through he'd gone through the depression being diagnosed with bipolar he'd tr- uh, attempted suicide and he got himself out at the other end of it. And he then started and by doing taking these small actionable steps and tangible things you can do to to, to get out. Um so I've been working with Paul for three years now, to be fair. So September twenty twenty one. Amazing. Two years, sorry, two years I've been working with Paul. Oh, an impact on on your kind of the way in which you've you've gone through this? Yeah, definitely. I now I can manage my moods a lot better, I'm a much better parent i'm a much better i like to think a much better husband um my business is a lot more organized i don't need to take all my life anymore and my definition of success has massively changed as well since my mum passed because previously to that i was like my dad my definition of success was spending every hour working it was getting every lead it was closing every deal it was making as much money as humanly possible because i was telling myself i am doing this for my family Uh, and winning every accolade in the industry and being the top advisor and winning this and winning that, that to me was success. But now my, with what happened with my mum, it made me realise how important family actually is. And it's the only thing that matters really. Uh, you can take all the money away tomorrow as long as I've got, as long as my family's safe. Um, and now my definition, definition of success is finishing work every day at five o'clock. It's switching my phone off one day a week. It's, going on holiday with Laura and the kids and switching my phone off entirely for the whole trip. It's doing the school runs. It's doing the school pickups. It's doing the bath and bed routine with the kids, like being fully present when I'm with my wife and children. That now is my definition of success. Mm. Um, and coincidentally, since I've done that, I've, it's forced me to be a lot more organized within my business, which has also then increased revenue. Um, so, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's amazing when we go through something devastating how much that can then positively impact our lives. You know? My biggest areas of growth have come from the darkest moments. Yeah. So I look, at, if, I look at bullying and I look at that as an example for so many people. They go through that and then as not, not in spite of, but because of their life is so much better. You know, I look at some of the, the trauma I've been through through, through various things. And one of that was, you know, a base jumping accident where it took me two years to learn to walk again. And it, and it, massively influenced my life in a very beneficial way and people say to me you know would you would you change anything you know well, well i'd like I'd, I'd love for some people to be back in my life but i can't change that but ultimately would i change the fact that i've gone through that difficult experience no because of what it's done for me and how it's impacted the rest of the world and the people around me and that's it's a, it's really hard to have that opinion but especially when it's something really traumatic when you when you look back and jump the dots you can kind of see how how there's this balance right in in the world and how that kind of plays out yeah, and that was one thing that Paul taught me. Is look, he said, look, look for the gift in every negative situation because you will find it. Sometimes it'll be harder than others, but you will find it. And it's only after sort of then looking back, like going through IVF. I mean, I've been fine. I've been financial services since I was sixteen, but I didn't always take my own advice. Yeah. So I've been in my late twenties, earning insane amounts of money, spending insane amounts of money, and then we went through IVF, and he got to the stage round four where he's. 15, 20,000 pounds a throw when you're in the Middle East, which is an expensive hobby, I'll tell you now. Yeah. Very quickly ran out of money. So it was only then going, th- if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have got my own finances in order and got a structure in place and start practicing what I preach. Yeah. With my mum diagnosed with cancer, I, I was massively overweight then. So, like I said, I boxed as a kid, always super fit, a weight cutting sport. Moved to Abu Dhabi. I know they, they call it the Abu Dhabi stone. I put about four stone on. So, we were doing the brunches, we were going out every week. Then when I was traveling around Saudi Arabia, 
living out of a hotel for four days, eating fast food, coming back, blow out at the weekends. I'd not seen my missus and my mates all week. So we'd be doing all these expensive brunches. We'd be going out for nice meals. I'd be drinking a skinful on a Friday night. So I was just ballooning in weight. Mm. We had the kids. I was like, I don't want to be a fat dad. I need to do something. But then they were in um, intensive care for two weeks when they were born. So I, but I'll start when they get home. Then we got them home. Sleep the snatch started. I'll start when they're sleeping all the way through the night. And then I blinked and a year had gone. And yeah. my mum got diagnosed with cancer. That, for me, was the rocky up the arse to go, she's had her life taken away from her. Her health, gone. Nothing she can do about that. I don't want to waste my chance. I want to see my children grow up. I don't want to miss that. So that, for me, was like a pivotal moment of yeah. when I started getting my health in order. Um, I mean, cause back then, 2019, I was, bearing around five foot nine, I was 120 kilo. Well, yeah. I looked like I'd swallowed a beanbag. And... So I then went on my fitness journey, if you want to call it that, and I lost 40 kilo. Wow. So now for me, health and fitness is it's just part of life. Like I have a very yeah. strict fitness regime, health, fitness, uh, nutrition. Like I have a coach who I check in with every week. Like everything's down, like I weigh everything out what I eat. Like some people will call it obsessive, but for me, I find happiness in that. I love the routine. I love the structure of it. I hardly drink anymore because that doesn't serve me. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people are in search of happiness, and they want they want to try and fill their life with happiness. And and I don't, I don't think as humans we're meant to. I think that I think that to be humans, you know, to be human means to suffer. And I think that you know you kind of choose how you want to suffer and what you want to suffer in. And ultimately, the the you know the way to do it properly is to choose the things that you value the most to suffer in. Right? It's like well. Building a family includes suffering. There are sleepless yeah. nights. There's challenges raising teenagers. There's you know you want to be a, you want to be an amazing martial artist. There's suffering involved. You want to be amazing in your career or your job. There's suffering, right? You want to be great at sport. There's suffering, and so ultimately you just choose your suffering. And I think that people who just try and seek happiness, they're they're rarely ever fulfilled because happiness is, I think happiness is, from a human perspective is just the pursuit of something, right? It's like. Yeah. pursuit of, of of growing something of learning something of creating something and i think that's i think that's what brings the most happiness to people i agree and i'm really big on goal planning so mm. i set myself 90 day goals every quarter across five areas of my life family finance focus fitness and fun and i have goals for everything and when i hit those goals yeah it's great for a little bit but the actual journey of hitting those goals and achieving, getting to those goals, that the journey itself is what I actually enjoy more than anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and like I said, that does come with suffering. And like one of my goal, one of my big goals this year, I did a photo, a physique fitness photo shoot in June um, where I got absolutely peeled inside out for it. And I was on a 20 week diet for a 20 week prep for that starting at the beginning of the year. Mm. And I learned so much about myself. Like I've always been in, a, well, I say always, since 2019, I've always been in decent shape, but I like, I pushed it to another level, like to the 1% of the 1%. I was like men's health cover side physique. That sounds quite arrogant, but I was very yeah. proud of what I did. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, the, the day was amazing. Like It was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. The burgers and the after was even better. But <laughs> but going through that, like being hungry every day, being t not sleeping because I was that hungry, aching every day, being in pain, being constantly tired. Like, it sounds horrendous, but mm. I have never been so dialed in. I have never been so switched. Yes. Yeah, I've yeah. never felt so alive as I was like five, six weeks out from my shoe when I was just restless and itchy and just, but it was amazing. Like, it, it just, I can't explain it unless you've actually been through it. You, you know what, I, I went through something similar myself. Um, and I've done a couple of shoots with, you know, getting down to kind of sub 9% body fat and, and really trying to push it. And doing four hours of uh, weights and cardio and walking every single day, and it's it's amazing even on a massive fifteen hundred calorie deficit or whatever, just how your body finds energy and you find clarity. And it's almost like the human body and the human mind is meant to be hungry. Yeah, we're not meant to be fully satisfied. Like if you really want to dial into peak human, you know, performance, it's about not getting everything. It's about leaving a gap and then forcing your body and your mind to fight for a little bit more creates that kind of edge right yeah yeah definitely have you ever have you read the book the um the way of the superior man no i think you really enjoy that it, it talks about living living on your edge and that's a great example of what you you know okay doing a really we're doing a really savage cut 
and getting down to that level, you're being on the edge with your body and your mind through, through like physical discipline, right? And through diet. But you can also do the same thing with business or with your career or whatever else it is. Yeah. You know? yeah. And being on your edge, people can see that. They can sense it, right? Yeah. It's not like being on the edge that like you're going to fall off. It's being on, being on the edge of your, of your capacity and your ability to, to perform at your highest level. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting um, yeah. view. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, this, in this chat we've had, I've, I've steered away from finances because, um, you know, and, and I know there's, there's so much value you could give to our listeners on that topic, but I also think there's so much value that our listeners could get from just learning about you as a person and a character and, you know, your life and the things you've been through and how relatable you are. Um, and if anyone wants to learn all about the incredible work you do when it comes to, um, you know, financial dependence and, and making sure they've got everything squared away, um, as an expat, they, they'll, you know, they'll, um, we'll send links out with this. They can come in, yeah, come and research that and, uh, and, and look at your content. And, um, but what I'd love to do to kind of finish up this episode is to hear from you, what would be the, the top three pieces of advice you would give to an expat family, um, who's currently living in the UAE, let's say, what, what would be the three, and they could be completely random, just three pieces of advice. Yeah. What would they be? So, okay, so look, everyone you speak to moves to the UAE, to the Middle East, for financial reasons. One or another, like whether, you know, it's tax-free, I earn more money, it's better opportunity for my family, it's, it's a better job prospect. That's all finance-related. But 60% of expats leave the Middle East in a worse financial position than when they went there. Okay? So that tells me that there's a disconnect somewhere, like that... The reason you go in and the reason you leave in doesn't match up. And in my opinion, it's because people get caught up in this, I call it the expat trap. They get caught up in this in this in this um lifestyle. Like it's like keeping up with the Joneses. Um and because there's always someone with a better watch, a nicer car, doing more brunches at the weekend, like it's very easy to spend money in the Middle East, as I know myself. So the first thing I would say to people is do a budget. To know what you're earning and know what you're spending. Um, another scary stat is 72% of expats in the Middle East don't have adequate life insurance. So that means either you've not got life insurance, you've not got enough, or the life insurance you've got back in your home country doesn't cover you in the Middle East. And a lot of people won't have checked this. So a lot of people have had a life insurance policy for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, moved to the Middle East, it's all right, I'm insured. You're actually not a lot of the time. Because a lot of those insurers in the small print, it says must be UK resident or South African resident, you're from South Africa or wherever it may be. So make sure that your family is fully protected. And if you have got an insurance policy, speak to your insurer and ask for it in writing that you are actually covered. Um, and the other thing I would advise people to do is pay yourself first as well. So most people save by proxy. So they get paid at the beginning of the month, they spend and then they save what's left. The way you should do it, or if there's anything left at all, what you should do is you get paid today, tomorrow, savings and investments, leave your bank account, and it's gone. So you pay yourself first, and then you spend what's left. And I will try and reframe this for people is, have you ever missed a mortgage payment? Me? Yeah. No. Right. Treat your savings the exact same way. Call it a bill, call it tax, call it expat tax, call it whatever you want to call it in your own head, but just make sure the day after payday, that money leaves your account and make it non-negotiable. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, the, the gravy training got to last forever for most people and you are going to have to leave them at least at some point. And this is, I think, where people go wrong is they think it's got to last forever. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's three pieces of brilliant financial advice. You know, and, and actually, it's it's things that we can implement straight away. So I, I always like to finish a podcast with things that people can actually implement. People like right. listen to podcasts, right, for entertainment. And, you know, a lot of the time, if you want education, it's all about implementation, right? So that, I think there's three things there that if people really wanted to improve their situation, they could they could literally take that and implement within the next 24 hours and make a massive difference. Yeah. And just, just to finish off then, what, what advice would you give to expats in general, non, non-financial advice? Is there any... Because you've been through a lot as as an expat, you know, being here a long time, being in the UK, being here, eventually moved back. What what's your kind of your kind of closing words and advice or outlook as an expat? Um, it's enjoy the experience, but at the same time, 
know that it's not going to last forever. Now, that might be on your terms or it might not. I.e., if you're employed by a company, that company is essentially responsible for you. If they pull the rug from under the car, pull the rug from under your feet tomorrow, you've got to leave. So again, I always just plan ahead um, and look and work out why you're there. Like I say, if you are out there to better yourselves, to make a a, f- a, di- a difference for your children, for your financial future, for whatever it may be, make sure your actions back that up. Mm. Um, like I say, because it is very easy just to get, and I suppose this is a little bit financial, but it's very easy to get sucked into the, this lifestyle in the Middle East. And I, I were guilty of it for the first few years. I were there till I had a rude awakening. But don't leave it till it's too late or don't have to go through what I went through before you realize you've been a bit of a prat with it. Yeah, I think it's very easy to get sucked into the um, to keeping up with the Joneses, right? And yeah. uh, lifestyle inflation. And as you earn more, spending more and so on and so on. And it's, yeah. It, you know what? It's, it's probably one of the most important bits of advice for an expat family. You know, yeah. Joe, that was epic. Really, really enjoyed. Uh, Likewise, uh, thanks for your time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. If there was a, a what's the best way for everyone to get to get a hold of you or to learn more about what you do? I'm on most social media platforms. So if you're on Instagram, Joe underscore Family Wealth One Hundred One, LinkedIn, just search Joe Woodhouse Family Wealth One Hundred One. I've got a website as well, FamilyWealth One Hundred One dot com. Amazing. Thank you again, Joe. That was awesome. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed today's Warrior Academy podcast episode. We're going to keep creating these episodes because I know that so many parents find them useful or get insights or get ideas about how to develop their child's character. But it all comes down to the three C's, confidence, conduct, and concentration. So if you want to get a deep insight into the levels of confidence your child has, the level of concentration they have, or the level of conduct they have, so that you can actually put a score next to it, and then work towards increasing those scores like we do in the Warrior Academy, then I'd love to invite you to fill in the breakthrough area assessment. It takes about five minutes of your time and you will get a personalized PDF report on your child's three C's. To access the breakthrough area assessment and find out your child's three C score, all you need to do is go to www.breakthrougharea.com. 